Uh, welcome to the European Jenkins Docs Office Hours. This is the uh, November 10th, 2022 edition. Uh, today, we have Mark Waite, myself, Bruno Brockton, and Alex Brandes here. Uh, for the agenda, we have a few action items to check on. Uh, the Jenkins elections, uh, lots of updates there. DevOps World 2022 was yesterday. Uh, we've had our weekly 2.377 release and our most recent LTS release go out and successfully. Uh, and we have our next LTS coming up at the end of November, uh, which will be the December LTS technically, uh, even though it's on the 30th this month. Uh, so uh, is there anything else that would need to be added to the agenda? Okay. All right. Then. Uh, so Mark, uh, archiving the docs mailing list, I know that that's still something that um, TBD, so. Yeah, sorry, still haven't done it and probably won't happen in November. Okay, no worries. Thank you very much. Um, we did publish the October newsletter, uh, October Jenkins monthly newsletter. Uh, so this uh, has the updates. Uh, so it has uh, the updates for uh, all the different SIG groups for Jenkins. Um, documentation, user experience, platform, uh, security. So uh, anything that we've been taking on the last month uh, is gonna be uh, available here. Uh, and um, going forward, we're gonna be having that available for the community as well to offer notes, suggestions, and any kind of feedback on it. Uh, so that will be uh, part of the newsletter process going forward. Uh, and then lastly, uh, since Hacktoberfest has ended, we are going to have a recap blog post for Hacktoberfest. Uh, it's gonna share user insights and uh, contributor insights and stories, uh, some stats overall from Hacktoberfest and advice quotes and uh, general ideas about the Hacktoberfest con contributing and project and just how everyone uh, kind of did this year. So uh, it's gonna be great. And uh, we'll have a lot of great information for from the, the uh, contributors. Uh, next thing on the agenda here is the Jenkins elections. So the voter registration and candidate nomination periods are open right now. Uh, and currently we have uh, 48 members in the Jenkins election voter group. Um, there are plenty of more contributors to Jenkins. Uh, so we really want to make sure that uh, everyone is aware and can join the group. Um, to join the group, all you need is an account on community.jenkins.io. You can use your GitHub account. Uh, or if you don't have a GitHub account or want to use a separate account for this, you can sign up and just dedicate it to the elect Jenkins election voting. Um, but uh, being a member on the site and having an account is required. Uh, and any prior participation is appreciated, but I would still the person would still need to register for the 2022 edition. Um, this is unique. We, this is a different group. Uh, and this is the list of folks who we will then send out to uh, the Condorcet Internet Voting Service so that we can proceed from there. Uh, voter registration is open until November 17th. So uh, by all means, there is still time. Please, uh, if you haven't already, go ahead and uh, sign up, join the group, create the account. Um, for the record, uh, instead of leave, it would say join here. So uh, this looks different because I'm already part of it, uh, but for a new user, you would have the option to just join the group right up here. And um, Kevin, I'm yeah. delighted to have Zinab um, Daudu with us, and I just sent her a message on how to register to vote. Oh, fantastic. So How hopefully within the next three or four minutes, we'll have 49 registered voters. Thanks, Mark. I'll check it out. Thanks, Zinab. <laughs> Thank you, Zinab. Um, candidate nominations are also open right now. Uh, they go until November 10th, so today. So. Um, there will be an announcement with all the candidates and their statements regarding um, why you should vote for them once the voter registration is completed. So uh, November 17th is the tentative date that all candidates will be announced. The voter registration is closed uh, and then voter voting itself will actually open at that time as well. 
Um, there's also a community discourse thread for this. Uh, for this, so uh, there's multiple points of contact, multiple points of uh, information. There's the blog post in the Jenkins community blog, the community discourse thread. Uh, and of course, um, we're talking about this as much as possible in all of the different office hours of meetings and uh, just across the board. Uh, the election process page in Jenkins has also been updated to reflect the 2022 uh, election. So even further information there and additional instructions on voting registration, candidates, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions on the Jenkins elections or any other um, items to raise? Register uh, to vote, please. Register to vote. Please, please, please. Yeah. And then vote. Yeah. Uh, participation is a big part of it. So, yeah. All right. Uh, so, DevOps World 2022 uh, was yesterday. It was held online since everything got kind of remixed and rescheduled. Uh, registration. Uh, was available to all. It is open since it's online now, uh, and it has been recorded. Uh, the re recordings will be available for anyone that had registered, signed up. Um, and I think you still might be able to sign up and sign in for that purpose. Uh, but the, rec the recordings are going to be available indefinitely. So uh, even if you weren't able to make the sessions that they had yesterday, they're still available and they, you can still see all the talks uh, and sessions that did uh, get presented there. Uh, the, there were a lot of talks that were not able to be presented in the online format. Uh, so what uh, we're hoping to do and looking to do is eventually reschedule those and have them presented as something like a Jenkins online meetup or uh, any other sort of community event that we can host. Um, that way we can present some of these other topics that uh, we did not get to share at uh, DevOps World. So uh, the plug and health scoring is one thing that we've been working on a lot recently. The Google Summer of Code participants helped out a lot with, um, and that's something that uh, we definitely want to share and elaborate on, but uh, want to make sure that we have the right space and the right uh, means to do so first. So we've we've got another voice here. Zenob and I had prepared a talk for DevOps World. Zenob, are you interested in doing that talk with me as a Jenkins online meetup? You're muted, Zenob, in case you're there. Hello, sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, so Kevin was just mentioning DevOps World 2022 and that many of the talks were not selected uh, to be presented during the online format. Yeah. We could consider presenting them separately as online meetups. You and yeah. I have prepared a talk. Are you interested in doing an online meetup with me to share our talk in that online meetup format? Yes, yes, I am. That was actually one of the reasons I joined um, the okay, session good. So, to talk about that. So, yes. So, so Mark and Zainab, Z A I, Z A I. And AB. Omotola will also be interested. If... Oh, good. Very good. Yeah. So, and I'll get that inserted later. And it's the talk is called Open Source, Open Source in Africa. And, and we'll get, ex I'll get more details. So that's great, Zinab. I'll, I'll look for a date, start the proposal, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect. Uh -huh. Now, another one on this same topic fits with Bruno and me. Mm -hmm. is this, we've got upcoming Google Summer of Code 2023. We'll start very, very intense promotion of it in the January, February time, but we could already start even sooner than that if we wanted to do a copy of the workshop that Bruno yeah. and John Mark and I had prepared, but to focus it online and say, we'll take up to six or up to four Google Summer of Code interested people and take them through the workshop, record it, and and do the whole exercise. But it would have to be a workshop format, and that's a very different thing than a Jenkins online meetup. Workshop format, we would really do it in in Zoom meeting, in a Zoom meeting, not in a webinar. And we would require pre-registration and have very limited attendance. But I think it's a possible if if we, if Bruno and others get hints that there are people who are interested in it, we could mm -hmm. do that pretty easily 
spend two hours with a group of four to six interested people and take them through a whole series of exercises on how do you contribute to open source. Very cool. And Bruno, that's, are um, you okay with what I said? Bruno may say, no, Mark, you're crazy. Uh, no, no, of course, 100%. Yeah, fantastic, great. And that'll be separate. That would be separate from the um, Contributor Summit um, workshop, yeah. uh, adopt the plugin tutorial, all that sort of stuff. That would be separate. It, it, it would be. It's This is a very different thing. It's focused on okay. taking four or at most six uh, people who, who have never contributed to Jenkins before mm -hmm. and bringing them to the point where in a two hour period, they successfully submit their first pull request. Pull request yeah. And that pull request is valid and useful and helpful to the project. Cool. So it's, nice. not, it's not a junk pull request. It's really a useful pull request and they've mm -hmm. run validations of it, etc. So it's, it's making them in two hours make that transition from non-contributor to first con contribution. Wow, really nice. That'd be really cool. I hope uh, I hope everyone can join up or at least share their interest levels on that because that sounds like a great time. Uh, sounds like a crash course like I got recently, so. Yep. Cool, all right. Uh, anything else on DevOps World 2022 to mention? Nothing from me. Okay, all right. Uh, so uh, we had our, week, our weekly release 2.377 uh, go out successfully. And the last week we had uh, our LTS 2.361.3, uh, that which will be the last release for the 2.361 LTS series. Um, last week there, uh, Darren, Pope and Mark were able to uh, do the live stream going over what's new with the LTS. Uh, so that's available in, on YouTube. And uh, we just had a, a, small a small section to go over the weekly change log process. Uh, as now I'm helping a lot more with uh, getting those change log entries updated and adjusted to be uh, better presented. So um, just to go over the process and, I, and then, uh, Alex did wanna share some insight he had into, uh, I think it was this, step, this second piece here. Um, so, uh, Alex, by all, by all means, um, just let me know, or I'll uh, stop when we get to that point, and I'm uh, more than happy to have you share what, what uh, you want to share. Um, so the first thing that happens for the weekly change log review process is I will just go through and review the weekly change log um, and verify that there are entries to change and what they need to be changed to. Uh, and then I'll create a draft pull request that's available for review and feedback uh, that just suggests the changes I plan that um, I'm seeing and want to make. Um, and then uh, once that's created, uh, Mark may or may not apply the changes um, prior to it being published. If it is published without the changes, I will go back in and update the change log accordingly. Um, otherwise, it can be adjusted prior to. Uh, but more often than not, uh, I'm going to go back in after the fact and update things as needed. Um, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks, Kevin. That sounds like a good workflow. Uh, yeah, that is placed properly there. Um, my initial question was, the automatic PRs generated are basically based on the proposed change log entry of pull requests submitted to Jenkins, like Jenkins, less Jenkins as the core itself. Mm -hmm. Are there a lot of things you need to fix up later on? There, there. Well, so because I've because well, I've seen you creating quite a few PRs on the Jenkins I/O repository over the past weeks. And so my question was, if there's something we as core maintainers could improve for, to the proposed change log entries section before we merge PRs to reduce the need of fix ups for later on. <laughs> so. I, I, so Kevin, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in here if that's okay. Yeah. Please. So Alex, there are some things that we can do that I think confidently would actually improve it and others where people continue to ignore what's written in the file and they'll continue to ignore it. So, so the first, what we can improve right now in the pull request uh, template, 
the the bullet item for the changelog entry starts with a dash. Yeah. And oddly enough, the translator only wants it to start with an asterisk. So if okay. we change that from a dash to an asterisk, we'll reduce one place where we regularly have to make fix-ups, where we have to make repairs. Now the, yeah, the sounds... others, what's that? Yeah, that sounds that sounds feasible. Yeah, I think I think that one is, and that one's one that's relatively easy to do and high probability that it will be retained. There are others where it says things like, please use the imperative form. And some people don't know what the imperative, and it even gives an example if I remember right, but really people don't read it. Or, or they, they write something that is completely different or off. And I think the answer there is saying use the imperative form is the best we're going to get. And Kevin or other writers will have to correct it as necessary. There's not much we can do to change that one. Yeah. Uh, it, as someone who submits a few pull requests which are not labeled as skip change log, I can only speak for myself, but I always find it hard to come up with a change log entry that is not super in detail. Because if I'm if I mention some files like in Jelly or something that I did change, that is not really helpful for the end user change log. Maybe for the GitHub change log, but not for something we publish on Jenkins.io. So I always try to break things down to make them easy to understand. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you often lose a bit of information then. And 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 that's exactly I think the value that Kevin and other change log reviewers bring is it's okay that the author of a pull request expresses the change log as best they can. Kevin now comes in thinking like an end user and his extra set of eyes may help us get a better one. So I think what you're describing is an ideal process. It's just fine. It's why we like that there's a team of reviewers that look at the change log after the, after the submitter does their best job they can. Yeah, I think that's needed because if you compare the change log of, from the GitHub releases tab with what we have on Jenkins.io, that's always a big difference into how things are actually described. Right. The GitHub change log is much more in, like uses much more technical phrasing mm -hmm. from what I noticed. So yeah. Exactly. And, and you're, you're, you're absolutely correct. And I think, I think that's okay, right? We, We've, we've said that we want and we like a curated change log. And we know that for LTS releases, we really have to have someone who, who decides what should be in or out. And, and so since we're going to be curating, we're going to be reviewing, uh, we'll just take advantage of that and keep doing it. And uh, one of the other things too, Alex, that uh, I've found I'm doing most than anything else is reordering the entries themselves because uh, a lot of them will come in with the developer ones at the top of the list which um, ultimately should be at the bottom of the list so it's a lot of rearranging and reformatting those as uh, i come across them so um it's not uh it's a lot just like of um, streamlining it and reformatting things more than uh changing anything there are some messages that i might uh, update to reflect a little bit better, like what happened, or um, if there is a bunch of small minor things that don't need to be described, like a spring security fix might um, summarize that part of it. But um, yeah, for the, like, honestly, I, I'm taking a lot of what's already there and just putting it into a different place. Um, well, you do make a good point, Kevin, on the, the developer changelog entries, the, 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 guidelines say move those to the end and the tool doesn't move them to the end and if a developer someone who's ex who comfortable with that tool could extend the tool to put developer items at the end that would reduce one of the things that's a, a fair one i mean on the different note i think the change log generator picks up the developer label we put on prs but this is, at least to my understanding, only useful for the GitHub change log because the Jenkins IO change log has only two kinds of items. Like we have bug fixes and we have enhancements. We can't really highlight something as developer or like as dependency updates there. Only if we are prefixing them, prefixing them with developer and then the entry. Actually, the, the, the change log has the concept of developer 
And if you look at the fields that the, ge the generator writes, one of them I believe is called category and developer is a valid value for that. So it, it, it actually does know about it, but it doesn't present them to the user in a visibly different way. We just have a, a working rule that if it's a developer topic, we put it at the end. But the, yeah. the generator doesn't do that ordering for us. And it, it is willing to do other ordering. It just doesn't do that one. Yeah, was, I meant it in terms of colors. Like for bug fixes, we have the red one. For enhancements, we have the purple one. And for security fixes, the yellow one. Like there's no real color to distinguish between what is actually for developers or what is like, uh, I don't know, an enhancement in terms of UI. And, and that you're correct. You are absolutely mm -hmm. correct. Um, thank you very much, Alex. I really appreciate that. Again, like that's um, awesome to be considering and thinking of and definitely helps uh, with kind of just what I'm looking at on a regular basis as well, for sure. Because uh, I want to make sure that this is uh, uh, what's being shared with me in the first place and what's, what everyone's working on. Uh, I definitely don't want to make any changes that change the message or um, take away from what was actually done as far as work goes. So uh, anything that, uh, any kind of feedback or anything that you think of that can uh, assist with that or make life easier for everyone, I'm, I'm always open to it. Yeah, no, I think you're doing a great job on that. I occasionally review the LTS change logs if I get the shot too, if I'm the release lead, but and everything mm -hmm. else I'm pretty happy with. <laughs> great, thank you, glad to hear it. Cool, all right. Um, so yeah, and uh, yeah, and we'll have um, the next LTS is going to be on the November thirtieth release. Uh, so this will be uh, two point three seven five point one. So the next uh, version we'll, we're going to be coming out with is uh, using baseline two point three seven five. Uh, so this will be the start of the next LTS line. Um, the change log and upgrade guide are needed still. Uh, so we're going to have the changes since two point three six one. Uh, and backports of anything since 2.375 was actually released. Um, Alex uh, is the release lead. So again, Alex, thank you very, very much for volunteering and taking over. As we go to the last, well, the last new LTS of the year, really, or the, uh, yeah, kind of, not really. But uh, yeah, really exciting, Re really, uh, really great stuff, and. Uh, there's a bit, there's been a ton of stuff uh, changed and fixed and added, uh, so there's going to be a it's a large change log this time around, which will be fun. Great. Uh, so we got through everything on the list here on the agenda. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to share or throw out there? Yeah, just really quick chiming in uh, on mm -hmm. yesterday and uh, not yesterday, last week's um, Asia Docs Office Hours, I think. What was it Chris or someone else brought up that the LTS checklist is pretty not much of use. <laughs> yeah, um, Chris, yeah, it looks like there was a mention of like Chris being able to share kind of his re uh, release lead experience. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would I would it. phrase it I would phrase it differently, Alex, not a not of much use. It was that yes, it's unclear. And there are times when it's, it assumes things that somebody who's a first time release lead doesn't know. Yes. Yeah, it's not much of use if you're doing it for the first time. <clears throat> right. Agree. Agree. Or especially if you're do it, doing it for the first time, if you are initiating the point one release line, because this one actually requires write permissions on core repositories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that the checklist might be a bit confusing. I mean, I got used to it over the past few releases, but maybe I could write something down like an actual text form rather than something in bullet lists to outline what actually needs to be done and how things need to be done rather than having a bullet list saying, hey, you need to do this and this here, but doesn't explain why things need to be done. Mm. Yeah, it would be helpful for young blood. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're willing to do that, that would be great. The, the, the reason we created the checklist originally was 
assuming that it would help experts make fewer mistakes. So the, the case I'm used to, the checklist story, is pilot in an aircraft who spent hundreds of hours flying airplanes, but a checklist assures they don't make, make foolish mistakes. But it's, it's not a training document. So what you're proposing, I, I love it. It's the idea of something that would be a tutorial, an introduction, or a training document, not just the checklist. I like that. If you're willing to do that, Alex, that would be great. Yeah, I think the checklist is likely written by someone who did those releases before and just wrote down what they had in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, was, that would be me and Tim Jacob. <laughs> you you nailed it, and and then refined by you, and refined by Chris, and refined by yeah. um, Ildefonso and Kathy Chan. Exactly. Yep. It's yeah, have, It was written by experts few... for experts. <laughs> yeah, we we have had quite a few PRs through the checklist over the past few months, updating a bit of documentation here and there, making things a bit more clear. And thanks to people like Joseph Patterson, who outsourced a lot of work to update CLI used in the Bill of Materials or JCASC to reduce the need to submit PRs by hand. But yeah, there's still a lot of stuff you need to do by hand, and that is barely to not outlined within the checklist. So I would like to go ahead and, I don't know, write a bit of it down how to actually do something especially outside of running the init LTS scripts. I like that. I, I wholehearted support for that. And, and thanks for tolerating the checklist. And as your first experience, you could have walked away in disgust and said, <laughs> I refuse to use this thing. Thank you very much. Yeah, my first release was actually one of the point releases after Ildefonso did that. And to my, from my experience, point releases are always easier and quicker to do than initial releases, given you have already a baseline to backport stuff and don't need to initiate one. Right. Well, and, and we find as the documentation team that it's a lot easier to write the change log for dot two and dot three than it is for dot one, right? Dot one is an awful lot of thought. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Appreciate that. And uh, the insight's really great to hear and um, clearly can lead to some improvements down the line. So uh, that covers everything that we had on the agenda for today. Is there anything else that anyone would like to share or bring up? I know uh, I already asked, but figured once again, in case like Alex spurred anything. Going once. All right. Um, so I, I think we can stop the recording then, Mark, and it will be a